Okay, um, today's subject is a perceptron, and I introduced uh, the perceptron formula, huh? which is nothing spectacular. It's just, I mean, the perceptron computes a linear combination <coughs> of the input features. Huh? The input features are these values x1 through xn, and then we compute a linear combination of these features. And then, here, there is such a, a threshold operation. Huh? Uh, no, sorry, here. The, the weighted sum of these inputs, this weighted sum is compared to some threshold. And as you can see at the moment, this threshold is zero. So, if the linear combination is greater than zero, then the perceptron outputs a one, otherwise a zero. Huh? Um, okay. And um, as we already have seen, <coughs> this uh, this weighted sum is a linear function. And if we look in two dimensions, in two dimensions, we have uh, not a uh, w1 x1 plus w2 x2 um, is equal to zero. I mean, here it says greater than zero, but equal to zero is the separating line, the line that separates the region where the perceptron outputs one and the other region. Huh? Okay, and such a uh, an equation with a linear left-hand side represents any straight line through the origin. Okay. So, that's very important because here in this picture you see the power of the perceptron and at the same time the weakness of the perceptron. So the perceptron is only able to separate um, two classes if, suppose this is class number one, if they are linearly separable. For example, these two classes can be separated by a perceptron. Huh? But if there would be one blue point here, it would be impossible. Okay, and maybe we look at this picture too. We can imagine such a perceptron um, as, as a neural network. I mean, this is really far, but um, it is, let's say, the simplest form of a neural network model. Huh? So we have these input features x1 through xn, and then here we have the output node of the perceptron. And uh, so we imagine that inside here there is a summation operator which computes the sum of all the weighted inputs. So x1 times w1 uh, goes in here and these two. And then in there we compute the sum. That's what we have here. And finally, the sum is compared with the threshold, and then we output one or zero. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and that's what we call a directed two-layer neural network. But it's an extremely simple model, which is quite far from biological reality. But we will later on talk about neural networks in more detail. Um, the input variables are called features. 
Uh, okay, we talked about this already. Yeah. Okay, and now let's look at the important thing, yeah? which is the learning rule. Um, and the learning rule um, determines the, the weights. Yeah? The learning rule determines the weight vector uh, given two sets of data points. Yeah? One set M1 for the positive uh, data points, or is it M plus, yeah? and another set M minus for the negative data points. Okay, and that's, that's the source code. You see, these are the input parameters, the two training sets. Um, and uh, initially, this weight vector um, can have an arbitrary initialization. You may set it to zero or whatever. Huh? Um, and then we go into this uh, loop. The, you see this loop uh, repeats until all data points are correctly classified. Okay? So, this loop may be, even if we don't know what happens inside the loop, this loop may be uh, an endless loop. <coughs> It may not terminate in, in uh, which case can you be sure that this loop will not terminate. Think of these data here. Yes, so if we have this point, this loop will never terminate because it runs until all x are correctly classified, but the perceptron can only separate two classes which are linearly separable. So if the data points are not linearly separable, uh, there is no chance for this algorithm to converge. So you have to make sure that your data points are linearly separable, otherwise you get an endless loop. Okay, I mean you could you could stop it manually, but then you don't know what happens. Okay, now let's look inside this loop. For all positive uh, data points, then we compute the weighted sum. If the weighted sum of the inputs is less than or equal to zero, and that means um, I mean, this is, this is done for all the positive, suppose the, the white ones are the positive data points, and we start with this one. Then we compute W times this vector. Huh? And if it is less than or equal to zero, huh? and that means this guy is below our separating line. Huh? So it's, it is not correctly classified. That's the point. So this tells us if this data point X is not correctly classified, then we make some change. Then we, uh, we set W equal to the old value plus this vector X. So then we just add this vector X to our W. And you will see in a few minutes that uh, doing this is not a bad idea. Okay, and then for all x in the negative data set, if w times x is greater than zero, that means if such a blue point is above the line, then we subtract x from w, and that's it. That's the whole algorithm. So it's extremely simple. And, I mean, why does this algorithm work? Yeah, let me give you an idea. Yes, uh, so what our perceptron does, I mean, here we have the core of the algorithm. This is part of the perceptron output function. We compute the linear combination of the x uh, components. Huh? 
And if this X is not correctly classified, then we make this change. So the new W is the old W plus X. That's what we have here. This is our new weight vector. Huh? And now we just try what does the new weight vector do if we apply it to our input X. So we multiply this new weight vector with X. And, and then we get W times X plus X squared. And what does that mean? I mean, look, this product, vector times vector, is a scalar. Yeah? It's, this, it's the, the scalar product. Um, so this result is just a number. And we add a number to this number, and this number is positive. OK, and now remember. This product W times X was negative. This is negative. And when we add something positive to a negative number, it gets closer to, to being positive. If we are lucky, we even the, the result of this even is positive. But at least this operation, uh, adding X to W, brings the result of our perceptron computation closer to positive. And that's what we want. Huh? So if this is not sufficient, then maybe other data points help us getting in the right direction. So um, let's look at this picture. The only data point which is not co <coughs> correctly classified is this guy. Oh no, maybe we should modify the example because here it does not converge. Let's do it this way. Okay, here you can see there is a solution. And now what happens? This guy is not correctly classified, so then we compute W plus X, and what happens is that this line moves a little bit in this direction. I don't know how much, but maybe so much. And then still this data point is not correctly classified, um, but it, our, our separating line is better. And then when we, when we enter this loop next time, then we will do, this, we will do the same operation again so we will again move it a little bit into this direction, and then hopefully we get this. Huh? And in this <coughs> at this position, our algorithm stops, because now all data points are correctly classified. That's the idea behind the perceptron. OK, and in case we have a data point out of the negative set. Then if the product is uh, greater than zero, then we subtract x from w. And now if we compute this product, we get w times x minus x squared. And you see, here we subtract a positive number, so it gets more into this direction. Okay, yes, and uh, here I have uh, um, an example, a really uh, tiny, simple example where you see what happens uh, when we apply the perceptron algorithms. We have, this is our positive data sets with two points and the negative data sets with two points in two dimensions. Our initial weight vector is this, and that means our separating line is this, x1 plus x2 equals 0. Huh? OK, and now let's look at the picture. This is our initial situation. Huh? These are the four data points. This is the positive class, 
is it? Let me see. Um, it's zero and 1.7 or something. Yeah, zero, 1.8. This is the positive class. Okay, so the black, the black points are the positive class, the, uh, the circles, the negative class. Okay, um, and as you can see, only this point is not correctly classified, and also you can see there is a solution. So uh, the data points are linearly separable. Okay, and this is our initial uh, weight vector. Yeah. And uh, this is the separating straight line. And now as you can see, or let's say it looks like um, our weight vector is orthogonal on the separating line. Why is this? Think about vectors. What does it mean for two vectors to be to be orthogonal? Yes, the inner product of the, of the two vectors has to be zero. Then they are orthogonal. Okay, and now the equation, this is the equation. Let's write it as a, um, a vector equation. W transpose times x is equal to zero. Huh? Okay, W is a vector, and X, <coughs> where do we see X on this green line? I mean, this is an uh, infinitely long line, so is this a vector or what is it? I mean, this green line is the set of all vectors uh, lying on this line. All vectors starting in the origin, so this may be an, an x vector. Now let's draw it. This may be such an x vector, or this may be one, or this may be one. So all the vectors on this straight line uh, are orthogonal to our weight vector. Okay. So it's easy um, to see when we know our weight vector how our separating line uh, uh, looks like. Okay. And now what happens? We go into our uh, perceptron learning loop. And then we start with all the positive data points if W times X is not greater than zero. W times X is greater than zero for these two because they are correctly classified. And now we, we, uh, we go into the loop for the, uh, the negative points. This point is correct, but this one is not. Huh? So for this one, what do we do? We subtract this vector, and this vector is, I mean, it's this vector. We subtract this vector from our weight vector. So we take the negative of this guy, and add it to the weight vector. That's what we can see here, hopefully, in gray. Yeah? Maybe I draw it again. This is the negative of this vector. And we add this to our weight vector. So we get a new weight vector, which is um, this guy here. That's the new weight vector. And that's what we can see in the next picture. This vector is the same as this yellow vector here. That's the new weight vector. 
Okay? And now we know the new weight vector, and therefore we also know the new separating um, line. Yeah? And now we continue. We again we start with um, with the, the black points with the positive data set and now this point is on the on the wrong side of let me see what happens here What did we do here? Oh yes, I see, okay. Yeah, so, I'm sorry, this, this was actually an error what I did here. I forgot to look at the positive data points. Huh? I just looked at the negative data points, this one and this one, and now this data point is on the wrong side of our line. so. We, we add the negative of this vector to our weight vector, that's what we have here. Huh? And therefore our line turns around like that. Okay, and uh, now we are here and still this point is not correctly classified. Or what? It Yeah. Yes. This point is not correctly classified. So we add the negative of this vector to our weight vector, which is this one again, um, and we end up in this situation, which is <laughs> quite similar to what we had in the beginning. Um, but that's the reason why this is an iterative algorithm. So we have to go uh, through all the data points as often as it's necessary. Okay, and now we do the same thing we did up here again um, and add so the negative of this vector to our weight vector and uh, we end up with this line and then this again is not correctly classified so we add the negative of this and now finally we are finished. So, yeah, and maybe you can see that, I mean, we are lucky, we are, we are finished after two iterations through our algorithm, um, but this may oscillate. So, it's, uh, I mean, I mean, there is no guarantee that after two iterations we are finished. Maybe we need 10 iterations, maybe we need uh, 500 iterations. But um, the good news is this algorithm converges. There is a convergence proof for this algorithm. And that's what we see in this theory. <coughs> but of course only if the two classes are linearly separable. Um, if they are linearly separable then the perceptron learning algorithm converges for every initialization of the vector W um, and, and uh, after convergence um, our separating hyperplane uh, divides the classes M plus and M minus uh, such that P of X is equal to 1 for all positive uh, data points and P of X equals 0 for all negative points. I mean, I, I, I don't give you the proof here, but um, this, is, this is part of the core of the proof. Huh? Um, so what, what, uh, what our learning rule does here is it moves our weight vector in the right direction. Huh? 
of course what we what we need to uh, I mean this is not yet a proof what is missing for a proof Why is this no proof? Can you give a counterexample? I have an idea what might happen if we if we just know this. Look at our example. What might happen is exactly what we had here. With this point, we move the line over in this direction, but this was way too far. Huh? And then <coughs> we move the line back, and it's almost at the same position as it was in the beginning. So it, may, it might happen that in the next step it again moves so much in this direction and back and forth again. So it might end up in oscillations and of course that has to be proven. I mean in the proof uh, they show that these oscillations they decrease. They're getting smaller and smaller and that's what you can see here too. Now this line doesn't go so far to the right. And why? Why, uh, why do these oscillations decrease? Here in this example you can see the weight vector is getting longer. The weight vector is getting longer and if this weight vector is longer then the relative turn of the weight vector is smaller because the length of this delta vector is the same as it was here but the weight vector here is longer and that's why the angle is smaller here. Yeah. Okay, and maybe we get an idea about how we can improve this algorithm from, from seeing this. So what you see here is our, um, our negative x vector that we add here is too long. Huh? Maybe we should, we should go into this direction, but much shorter, just this little bit, and then we would, we would turn the line like that. So we should not, the idea is, these weight changes, W is equal to W plus X. So we should not add X, but we should add some alpha times x. Uh, and this alpha uh, should be less than 1. Uh. <coughs> so if alpha is a small number, then we, we make the changes in the right direction, but the, the, the danger that the, the turn in the right direction is too big is not so, is not so big anymore. Uh. And uh, so th if we add such an alpha, this is called the learning rate. So the learning rate tells us how fast we want to learn. Yeah? The bigger the learning rate, the faster we learn. I mean, we might even make this alpha greater than one, and this leads to even, even bigger uh, changes of our weight vector, but this is dangerous it may turn our weight vector too much in, the, in this direction. And I mean this learning rate will, will appear uh, quite a couple of times. Huh? Uh, especially in the next chapter when we talk about neural networks. Huh? In neural networks the learning rate is very important, uh, but on the other side 
the learning rate um, is a parameter that has to be adjusted manually and that's not nice huh? because of course we want to have uh, we want our learning algorithms to be fully automatic and the more parameters you have to adjust manually uh, the more it's not automatic okay so we proved convergence um, yes okay yeah but now we have the problem that our perceptron um, cannot divide arbitrary linearly separable classes it can only divide classes which are linearly separable by a line through the origin uh, and this is not nice at all huh? so now we will uh, we will use a nice little trick to uh, such that we can use our perceptron algorithm this simple perceptron algorithm and with this algorithm we will be able to separate data points um, arbitrarily uh, arbitrary da data points which are linearly separable um, so what we what we want to have is such a, uh, a hyperplane. Huh? We want to have a, a hyperplane with a fixed theta on the right hand side, and this is, uh, corresponds to a line which is shifted away from the origin. Huh? And the nice uh, answer is we can do this with the old algorithm we do not need to change the algorithm we have to modify our data points a little bit yeah and now yeah maybe how shall we uh, yeah let's let's just uh, start with this formula no? um, this is our linear combination of the input features so we take one input vector x and then we compute this linear product over all the x's yeah? um, yes and so yeah what we do now is if these data points are two dimensional let's write them down so x1 is equal to 1 comma 1 um, or let's say how is it uh, x1 plus in the plus uh, positive x2 is equal to um, 1 comma 2 and now we modify these data points um, into um, x1 plus and now how uh, let's just put a bar on it okay is equal to 1 comma 1 comma 1 and x2 plus bar is equal to 1 comma 2 comma 1 so what we do now is we add an extra component to the end of all our data vectors to all the positive vectors and to all the negative vectors we just make them longer but just longer we add a 1 at the end of all the vectors so now our our new longer vector has length n so the old vector had length n minus 1 okay so this sum can be written as the old sum of length n minus 1 plus yeah plus what is it 
So the sum i equal 1 to n w i x i is equal to the sum i equal 1 to n minus 1 w i x i plus w n x n. Okay? And now you see why we added a 1 at the end of all the vectors because now this xn this is equal to 1 so we get plus wn okay and now um, we, we give this wn a new name we call it theta and then this is sum over i. Uh, no, we call it minus theta. Minus theta. Okay? Um, and this, what we had here, is our separating hyperplane. If this is the separating hyperplane for, the, for the, an ordinary perceptron, then the whole thing has to be equal to zero. Okay, and now we take this equation and bring the theta on the right hand side and we get... Oh, oh sorry, this must be n minus one here and here. Um, is equal to theta and we are finished so you see this is a nice trick a nice trick we add a one at the end of all the vectors so we make the vectors longer from length n minus one we come to length n and because the last component of our vector is constant all the time it is one all the time we can just omit this xn so we get the wn so this last weight wn uh, we can see this last weight as a constant threshold it's not multiplied by x and therefore we bring it to the right hand side and now we have this equation is the equation of an arbitrary separating hyperplane which is shifted away from the origin. Yeah. What, I, what did I want to say else? Okay, yeah, let's go back here. In the application, so if you get your training data, the first thing you have to do is add a one at the end of all the training data vectors and then use the normal uh, perceptron learning algorithm train a perceptron uh, for this um, yeah and and then you can apply this perceptron to new data points but of course you also have to add a 1 at the end of these new data points and then it will uh, work correctly yeah and the interesting thing is that um, our hyperplane which is 
a hyperplane through the origin in n dimensions may be an, a hyperplane, a shifted hyperplane in, um, in, the, in the space with lower dimensions. Um, yeah, let's look at such an example. in three dimensions. In three-dimensional space, let's use a hyperplane defined by two vectors. Um, yeah, which one? A hyperplane through the origin um, I mean, we, we just take a simple hyperplane. Let's take these two vectors. So this is the hyperplane which is parallel to the axis x1 uh, and x3. Okay, so that's easy to imagine. And now, what we now do is we fix our last component of the vector to be 1 which is x3. Yeah? So suppose we have 1 here and then uh, we are in, um, in a space which is defined by this vector and this vector. So it's a, it's a plane parallel to the x1, x2 plane. Yeah? Yes, okay. And, and now, uh, what is the separating line in this space? Oh no, that was not a good example. Yeah, sorry. Because the separating line is now the X2 line. Huh? Sorry. So we have to use um, let's let's put this vector here a kind of diagonal. So this vector should be uh, in the middle between these two. So our separating hyperplane goes like that. And now, in uh, if we put x uh, three equal one then here, then uh, all our data points lie in this plane, in this plane defined here. And our, our line, our separating um, straight line in this new space now is the intersection between this yellow plane and this plane here. And the intersection, um, yeah, as you can see, this may be a line um, which is, is it parallel to this? Yes. So it's this line, which, go, which does not go through the origin. I mean, the origin in this new space would be this, but we have this separating line. So the trick basically here is we add 
a new dimension to our data points. And not only here, um, in, in other learning algorithms, this, uh, uh, this or a similar trick is used, we just add dimensions. We add dimensions and through, uh, from adding dimensions, we can make uh, our data points linearly separable. Uh, so in the new space, uh, the data points are linearly separable. Yeah. Okay, yes. Okay, and from this, um, we can now, we have actually proven now this new theorem, um, which is now the convergence theorem um, for arbitrary linearly separable data points. Yeah? So a function f can be represented by a Peltzeplon if and only if the two sets of positive and negative input vectors are linearly separable. Yeah? Okay, yeah. And now let's look at an example. Let's show what this uh, simple Peltzeplon algorithm uh, is able to do. So what I, what I did is, I produced some simple pixel images. Uh, we have a 5 times 5 pixel matrix, and there we have black and white pixels. And um, I mean, as an input for the Peltzeptron, I represent such a pixel matrix just as a vector. Yeah? So we just uh, add, so it's a vector, vector of length 25. Yeah? It's a, a vector of 25 uh, numbers 1 and 0. Okay, and the black ones are the ones and the white ones are the zeros. Um, yeah, and now this is our set of positive training examples and this is the set of negative training examples. So it's, it's kind of a pattern recognition task like recognizing characters. So we used these guys as positive uh, training examples and these as negative training examples. Um, and then also I produced some test patterns in order to see how these test patterns uh, will be classified. Okay, and now if I apply our Peltzeptron to these uh, f three positive and three negative training examples, after four iterations over all patterns, the algorithm converges. I mean, of course, we have to use an input vector of length 26. We have to add this one at the end, otherwise um, we may get problems. Huh? Um, and also, I mean, I just produced these training samples, so I don't know whether uh, these two sets are linearly separable. Huh? But, uh, I mean, from this result, that our algorithm converges after four iterations, now I know these training data are linearly separable. Otherwise, the Peltzeptron algorithm wouldn't stop. Okay, yeah. Um, now, um, I, want, I wanted to test this algorithm um, I mean, basically, I, I wouldn't need to test the algorithm. Why, why is it not necessary to test this algorithm? Because when the, the Peltzeptron learning algorithm stops, I know that it classifies all six training samples correctly. Um, but I want to, to check 
whether this algorithm is fault tolerant. So what I then did is I took all the training examples and flipped a number of bits. In the first step I flipped one bit in all the training samples. Maybe I flipped this bit here and uh, this bit here and this bit here or, or any other bits. Yeah? And then I check I mean it would be nice if only one bit is flipped that it would uh, um, it would recognize this noisy example as, as this guy here. Huh? And I flip more and more bits and then we look whether um, the algorithm still uh, recognizes all the training samples correctly. And that's what we see here in this uh, graph. So on this axis we see the number of bit flips starting from uh, zero up to 25. I mean 25 is quite a, quite a lot. So 25 means actually I flip all the bits so my image now is the inverse of the original image. Yeah? Um, and you can also see that in the middle between 0 and 25 here um, it is kind of impossible to recognize the image because uh, uh, I mean this is the inverse image. This is the inverse image which is quite similar to the original image. So the image that is uh, farthest from the original image is actually here. Yeah? And what you can see is, so what we, what we see here on, on this axis is the correctness. The correctness um, this gives us uh, the relative um, what is it? The relative amount of training data being recognized correctly. So a one means all training data are correctly uh, not training data, all test data, all noisy test data are correctly classified. Yeah? And we have a one here after flipping one bit. Yeah? And after flipping two bits it, it uh, gradually decreases and uh, here in the middle we have uh, something a little bit below 50 percent. Uh, and I mean uh, a classification rate of 50 percent uh, it can't be worse because 50 percent is randomly guessing. We have two classes and if I do a random guess uh, without knowing, knowing anything I have a correctness of 50 percent. So this is, so what we have here, this is really bad. Huh? But I mean if we, if we, if we uh, have only a few bit flips like one or two or three, yeah actually up to four bit flips the correctness is quite good. It's above 90 percent. So around 95 percent. So you see with this extremely simple Perceptron uh, we even get fault tolerance. So it can recognize noisy input images. Which is quite nice and I mean this is one of the, the features that the neural network people like. I mean this is a property of neural networks. They are inherently fault tolerant. You don't need to add some fault tolerance mechanism. They are, they just are fault tolerant. Okay, yes. Optimization and outlook. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have slow conversions. This is a unfortunate property of the Perceptron, uh, especially in higher dimensions. I mean if I use such tiny toy examples uh, then everything is, uh, uh, we have no problem. But in high dimensions and high dimensions, think of such pattern recognition examples. If we do pattern recognition on a thousand by thousand pixel images, then our vectors have a length of a, uh, a million and that means 
our space has one million dimensions and then things are getting harder. No? Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, and um, so we already talked about one optimization idea which was adding such a learning rate. Yeah? Um, yeah. And also, let's go back to our uh, picture. Well, here. So what we saw uh, was that adding the full x vector to our weight vector is not always a good idea. That's why I introduced this learning rate alpha here. But maybe as a first step, uh, yeah, let's look where we have such an example. Yeah. When this, this point is incorrect, then we add such a long vector to our weight vector. And adding a long vector to the weight vector means a big turning angle. But if, for example, this point is not correctly classified, which is much closer to the origin, then the angle by which we turn our weight vector is much smaller. Huh? And I mean, there is no real justification. Uh, you can see that the, the turn angle we would need here is quite small, but what we get from this long vector is a large turn angle. Um, here we would need a much bigger turn angle, but the vector is shorter, so this is, this is not really what we want. So the first idea is um, we normalize this vector x. So we take, we, um, our learning rule would now be um, w is equal to w plus x divided by the norm of x. Huh? So we just add the normalized vector x. And then the influence of all the vectors is kind of the same. Okay, yeah, that's what we do here. Um, yeah, and also uh, we can uh, use a better initialization of our weight vector. So in the algorithm it just says you can use any weight vector, whatever you want. Huh? And it will converge. But the question is how can we um, improve our conversion speed? Um, and that can, can be done uh, by the following idea. Suppose this is class number one. And uh, this is class number two. Um, okay. Now, of course, we immediately see where the separating hyperplane uh, should be. And we would get a quite a good result without using any perceptron algorithm by just saying, okay, the, uh, the center of gravity of this yellow cluster is somewhere here. And the center of uh, <coughs> the, uh, of the blue cluster would be 
maybe somewhere here. Right. Yeah? And now as a heuristic for initializing our weight vector, we take a line connecting t these two centers and then at the middle of this line here we take a perpendicular hyperplane and you see we're finished. So we don't need a perceptron. This is a much better algorithm. Why is it much better? It is much better because we only need one iteration over all data points. No more iteration, no more convergence problems. But this does not work all, always. How, I mean, we just need to modify our, our training data a little bit and it doesn't work anymore. Can you give me an example where this uh, simple heuristic doesn't work? Look. <coughs> yeah. Let's modify it a little bit. add some more points. So we have really much weight around this point and here the same. Now this, this heuristic works even better. But what we do now is, um, and yeah, let's add some points here and some points here. Now let's put um, one yellow point here and one blue point here. Now the, the real separating hyperplane would be like that. But what does our heuristic give us? These centers here, they wouldn't change. I mean these two little outliers they wouldn't change the centers very much. Maybe it moves from here to there and from here to there. Huh? But the connecting line is basically the same and our hyperplane would be maybe like that. So you see this is a heuristic. And even, I mean, starting with this hyperplane um, as initialization for the perceptron is not a bad idea. It is much better than using this as a hyperplane. So this, uh, I mean, this can, can only give us um, a good initial, or, uh, no, uh, um, a probably good initialization uh, for our weight vector. And this is the formula. So this is the center of gravity for, for the uh, positive data points. This is the center for the negative data points. And the difference between these two vectors, which is this one, um, that's what we use as our weight vector. And you know, the weight vector has to be orthogonal on the separating hyperplane. Okay, yes, uh, but still the perceptron can only separate data classes which are linearly separable and this is of course a disadvantage. So if our data points are not linearly separable then we are getting severe problems with the perceptron. Huh? 
But, I mean, there are um, types of neural networks, multi-layer ne networks, for example, uh, backpropagation, which are more powerful. They can separate uh, <coughs> data classes which are not linearly separable, and we will see them later when we get into uh, the neural networks chapter. Okay, yeah, now we look at a, at a second uh, learning algorithm which is even simpler than the perceptron. This is the nearest neighbor method. Yeah. Um, and the nearest neighbor method, the idea is completely different. I mean, what we, d what we did here is we take our data points and then apply these learning algorithms to our data point and after learning, our knowledge is represented inside our brain. Now, yeah, t uh, tell me, where, where is the knowledge stored? Where in our brain is the knowledge about the data points stored? Or, uh, what is the brain of the perceptron? Maybe that's a better question. Yes, the weight vector is our storage. Huh? Okay, so this is the idea of the perceptron. We compile our data points into this weight vector. And see, um, look at this example. Maybe we have 100 data points, but in a two-dimensional world, um, our weight vector consists of two numbers. So we compile, if we have 200 data points, two components each, so we have, in the beginning, the data points consist of 400 numbers. And now what we do in the perceptron, we compile these 400 numbers into two numbers. Two numbers. So this is a, a really like a, a data compression uh, method. And learning, basically, is data compression. Huh? Think of what you did at school. I, I still remember <coughs> mathematics. And even at school, I thought, I like mathematics because I don't have to memorize so much stuff. I mean, I do exercises for learning multiplication. I do maybe 100 exercises, which are kind of 100 data points. But inside my brain, once I understood how multiplication goes, I just have to memorize, I don't know, three rules. And that's it. And with these three rules, I can in the future uh, solve infinitely many multiplication problems. So learning basically is data compression. Data compression, that's very important. Huh? And that's why I hate it learning vocabulary, learning poems, and all that stuff. Because here, you really have to memorize every word. Huh? Even little variants of a word have to be memorized. Huh? OK, yes. So that's very important. Learning, basically, is data compression. If you do no data compression, you have a problem. Huh? Because I want to generalize. Think of the mathematics uh, stuff. As soon as I know these three rules for multiplication of two numbers, I am finished. But these guys who do not know the rules, but they know the training examples, they may have a problem. If you only memorize the training example, what can you solve then? You can uh, solve your training examples again, but nothing else. So you can solve 100 problems, uh, but if you memorize the rules, you can generalize. You can solve infinitely many problems. <coughs> That's very important uh, with uh, machine learning. So all machine learning algorithms should be able to generalize from your training data 
to an infinite set of arbitrary new data. And the Perceptron does. It compiles the training data into this weight vector. And what you can also see here, that's, uh, yeah, that's also important. Um, yeah. Suppose we are in two-dimensional space and now we take a new set of training data. Let's make them blue and yellow again. Um, we take these two uh, data points. Oh no, let's, let's put the blue guy here. Okay. And now we train our uh, separating hyperplane and um, the result may be this. But it may as well be this or it may be this. And these hi uh, three hyperplanes there are as different as it can be. This effect is called overfitting. Why is this overfitting? Because actually here our learning is no data compression. I mean the, the um, yeah, almost no compression. Okay, here we need two numbers, this is two numbers, this is two numbers, so we have four numbers. Uh, in our data points and two numbers in the weight vector. Uh, this is a compression by a factor of two which is, too, uh, uh, which is not enough. Uh. Why is this not good? You uh, the other view is the amount of training data we used is too little. Yeah? Depending on how, suppose we would use more training data um, and maybe the yellow points look like that and the blue guys like that, then we know, okay, this is the solution. Yeah? Um, but with, uh, with using only two data points, we may have got this as a solution and then what happens is overfitting. This is what we call overfitting. So we are fitting something which is... Um, overfitting means we put artificial information in our model. Yeah. Okay, so what this algorithm, so the Perceptron, is out of a class of algorithms that does comp data compression. Huh? Um, yeah, and, and to tell it already, this class of algorithms is called eager learning. Eager learning algorithms. Huh? Um, why is it called eager? Because um, I'm, I'm quite busy working during the learning, learning phase. You see the Perceptron, it may take a lot of time to converge. Yeah? So it's really hard work, the learning phase. And now with the nearest neighbor algorithm, yeah, let's look here. We are just lazy. Now we look at a lazy learning algorithm, which is the nearest neighbor algorithm. And what do we do here? We just store our data points and that's it. That's it. I mean, that's what unfortunately some students do. They just write down what they see in the lecture and then they take their book home, put it into the shelf and think, okay, that's learning. Huh? That's what we call lazy learning. You just write it down, take it home, put it into the shelf and maybe later on when you need this knowledge, you take the book out of the shelf 
and look into it and maybe it helps you. Of course it may, it may help you uh, if it's just a poem that you store in the shelf and then of course you can read it again or if it's vocabulary but if it's about mathematics maybe it doesn't help you. Or may, maybe it does help you because then you read these examples and then maybe you will infer something and you will learn it again. Okay, but that's the difference. Lazy learning is just writing, it, writing the, da the, the training data down here and storing them. That's it. I do basically nothing during lazy learning. Okay, but lazy learning is actually, I mean, it was in the last, in the last 20 years, the power of lazy learning was extremely underestimated. And nowadays, during the last, let's say, three or four years, machine learning uh, experts, they uh, recognize the power of lazy learning. I mean, it's different to, uh, to us humans. For us humans, lazy learning typically is not so good. Yeah? But for the machines, for the computers, lazy learning is extremely powerful. Yeah? So we, we should not underestimate the power of lazy learning. How does lazy learning work? We just store our data points. And now, um, I mean, what do we want? We want to have a classifier. We want to have an algorithm that, given a new data point, classifies it correctly. So here we have the separating uh, line for the perceptron. Now the perceptron, um, if a new data point, maybe this one comes, the perceptron would, would immediately tell you, okay, this belongs to the blue class. That's it, okay? That's how the perceptron works. But now we do lazy learning, so we do not calculate this separating line. What do we do? We just store the training examples and now when this new point comes we do nearest neighbor calculation. And what, is, uh, what happens? Um, I compute the distance from this new point to all blue points. To all blue points. Okay, and the distance to all yellow points. And then, among all these distances, I take the minimum. And the minimum, of course, is this guy here. This is the minimum distance. And now I know which is the, the nearest neighbor to my new data point, which is this guy, and I will classify the new data point, um, I will put it into the class of this nearest neighbor. That's it. That's lazy learning. Okay, and this lazy learning is extremely powerful. First, it's extremely simple. It cannot be simpler. I mean, if I ask you to program a lazy learning learner, that's just trivial. You just store all the data points and that's it. And oh yeah, and then for the recognition, you have to compute the Euclidean distance from the new data point to all, our, all the data points and then s select the appropriate class. That's it. It's, it's really, it's extremely simple. And now let me show you the power of this extremely simple algorithm. I guess you agree it's simpler than the perceptron, but it's much, much better. It's way better. It's far better than the perceptron. Why? Look, this new algorithm would classify this data point correctly. Yeah, no, I, I mean, now we use data points. Let's take some extra blue data points like that. And now our data set is extremely not linearly separable. But nearest neighbor would, nearest neighbor would actually find a separating line 
which it looks like that. No problem. I mean, these, this is the the the, uh, the the set of points where these blue guys are the nearest neighbors. This is the set of points where the yellow guys are the nearest neighbors. So nearest neighbor algorithm um, is extremely good in terms of uh, difficult uh, classification problems. Huh? Um, what is the disadvantage of this lazy learning algorithm? Look at what we did here, this nearest neighbor calculation. There is uh, a real drawback to this algorithm. Uh, how to calculate What do you mean with harder? What does harder mean? The pocket one, you have to just look at it above or below the line, yeah. and there you have to compare with each of the Yes, lines. so it, it takes much more computational effort. In the perceptron, you only have to execute if w times x greater than zero. That's extremely simple. I mean, this is a calculation which takes you maybe a nanosecond. Huh? Now suppose we have a million data points. Then we have to compute the distance, the Euclidean distance from our new point to a million data points, which costs you maybe a few seconds. Huh? If, the, if the dimension of your space is large, Suppose we have a 100 dimensional space, then compu computing the distance from this point to one point already costs us some time because we have to compare 100 components, uh, square all them, and then the square root. That costs you a little bit of time. That's, that's comparable to what, we, what the perceptron does. But we have to do this a million times, so the, the computational time is one million times what the perceptron needs yeah, in the recognition phase. That's the real drawback, and that's we are, why we are not yet finished with the machine learning chapter. If we wouldn't have this problem, then everybody would use uh, nearest neighbor method all the time. Yeah. But, I mean, this nearest neighbor method, what we are missing here is the data compression part. Data are not compressed at all. We just store them. Yeah? This data compression is missing. And the data compression, compressing the data into this weight vector, really reduces the amount of knowledge we have to store. And it leads to very fast computation in the recognition phase. OK, so much about introduction to machine learning. So I hope you now got a little bit the flavor of machine learning and learned about the difference between uh, eager learning and lazy learning. And we will see a couple of uh, other, uh, of course, better uh, learning algorithms in the next few lectures.